All right, maybe you can give me your attention. Thank you guys, thank you for coming. Uh, we're gonna talk about the parietal cortex today. I'm gonna show you some of the evidence for how value is encoded in the parietal cortex. How do we value things around us and how that's reflected in the activity in the neurons there. We'll look at a disease that affects the parietal cortex, stroke, and how can damage the parietal cortex and what happens to people when they get damaged in the parietal cortex. And we'll see that it, it, affects, it affects how they value things around them. They become um, evident in them that, that there is neglect. Basically they begin to not pay attention to items that appear to one side of the visual um, uh, fixation. So they begin to neglect things on one side. And then we'll, we'll talk about another aspect of parietal cortex damage, and it's called apraxia. That's when you lose the ability to do things that you used to be able to do using tools and using um, um, uh, things that you learned how to use with your hands. So we'll talk a little bit about these aspects, and we'll talk a little bit about how learning um, through a form of adaptation uh, appears to help one of those patients, the, the patients that are, ha, are suffering from um, uh, neglect. And I'll, I'll show you that. And we'll do an experiment today in class as well. So you can be a part of uh, that learning. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we have the problem of making a reaching movement. Say your hand is here, you want to reach to this target, and you're looking at this point here. That's your fixation. And we said that, well, you know, your parietal cortex makes estimates of things like where's your hand with respect to fixation, where's the target with respect to fixation. And then another part of your brain, the frontal lobe, makes an estimate of this vector that says, okay, you want to go from here to here. That's the difference between these two vectors. And these become the displacement vector that you want to do. And, and now you have to take this into account, but then ask, why am I reaching here? Is this, is this an apple that I'm reaching for? Or is, it, or is it something less valuable? Maybe a pencil? Or maybe more valuable, a donut maybe? And that's going to influence what I call costs and rewards. So why is it that I'm performing this task? And the way I perform it is a reflection of the value that I assign to that stimulus which is the idea that you're going to reach faster to things that you value more, you're going to move your eyes faster to things that you value more, and by looking at how you move, we could get an estimate of how you value things around you. So that becomes this notion of cost and rewards. This translates into motor commands, and that becomes the movement that you make. So we're going to begin to see some evidence for this reward-dependent representation, this economics of the movement, in the brain and how when there's damage to a part of the brain those economics become so large that people are unwilling to make movements toward that side and we'll see that as an example of neglect okay so we saw evidence on Monday that parietal cortex has neurons that represent things with respect to the fovea and so they prefer things to one side they have a response field but they're different than visual neurons in the sense that if you take away the stimulus they still fire so you don't need to see something and look at it and have the stimulus be available to you when you can make a movement toward it. I can remember that something was there and move toward it even though it's gone so here's an example of this so here's a cue that goes on and then here's when the go signal comes and so between when the cue goes on and the go the stimulus is on the screen. So I'm looking here, there's a stimulus here, the stimulus stays there and then I make a movement toward it. Well I can make a movement toward the stimulus even after it goes away because I can remember that the stimulus was there. And you see that here's a parietal cortex neuron. So the cue has been turned off here but the animal is going to be able to make a movement toward it and the neuron remembers that the something of value was at that location. So it does, it's not like a retinal cell that you have to have a stimulus that's there present for you to be able to uh, remember it and make a movement toward it. This is an fMRI experiment and the reason why I want to show it to you is because even with fMRI which is a very coarse measure of neural activity you can begin to see the influence of the fact that when you're looking straight ahead a stimulus to the left is going to activate things on the right and stimulus to the right is going to activate things to the left. And so when I move my eyes, depending on where the goal is, that's going to change the region of the brain on the left side, on the right side, that's going to become activated. So let's look at the, the experiment. The experiment is a person is lying in the scanner, they look at the screen, it says S. S means saccade. You're going to make a saccade in this trial. 
As you see the letter S, you keep looking at the S and there's a stimulus that appears on the left side. That means you're going to be making a saccade to that, but not yet. So the stimulus goes away, you keep waiting, and now the target comes and then you make a saccade to it. So basically you can prepare to make a saccade to the left, even though at this point there is no stimulus on the screen. And the idea is that while you are preparing to make a saccade to the left, it will be the right parietal cortex that becomes activated. So the stimulus of interest is on the left side of the screen, left side of fixation, and that's going to activate neurons on the right side of the parietal cortex. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's do this experiment in a different way. Suppose that I'm looking at this and now you're going to show me here's the place that I'm going to have to make a movement. Say this is an apple here. Apple's going to appear here. But before you let me make a saccade to that apple, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to take the apple away. Now I'm going to take this and move it out here. Okay, so the apple would have been here now. So the apple that used to be to the left of fixation, now is to the right of fixation. Right? Do you see that? Okay, so the thing that is of value to me, the apple, has changed its position with respect to fixation. So now, as I'm preparing to make a movement toward the apple, it's to the right of fixation, whereas it used to be to the left. So, when I'm waiting to make a movement toward the apple, the activity should be on my left parietal cortex. Because I changed fixation. Does that make sense? So let's go over it again. I'm looking at this. An apple appears here. Apple goes away. So this is the place that I have to make a saccade to. You move this point out here. The apple now would have been here. If I'm asked now to make a movement to where I remember the apple to be, I'm going to make a right saccade. That right saccade is going to be represented in my left parietal cortex. And that's what you see here. Okay? Any questions about that? All right. Okay. I don't know why this is there. Sorry about that. Okay. So, about 20 years ago, as people began to look at the activity in the parietal cortex, they began to notice that it isn't really the stimulus that matters. The fact that matters is that that stimulus has value. So unless that stimulus has value, the neurons don't really care about it. So if you can imagine, most of these experiments that I've described to you so far are in this impoverished environment where there's very little on the screen. There's a dot on the screen, there's a stimulus that appears and you make a movement toward. Well, in the, in the real world, of course, that's never the case. We have all kinds of things in our visual screen, right? That we have, I have this entire field of faces that are on my visual system. So the face that I choose to look at somehow has to pop out among that faces, right? So the idea is that about 20 years ago, scientists began to notice that the parietal cortex wasn't just encoding the fact that there is a stimulus in the response field. What, what began to encoding was that that stimulus has value. And the reason why I'm going to have a response is because I'm going to have to make a movement toward it. So let me show you an example of one of these experiments. So here's a monkey that's looking at this fixation point here, this little tiny black dot. It's called fixation. And there are these eight symbols on the screen. Now, the cell that they're recording from in the parietal cortex has a response field out here. And as you know, this, this response field is attached to fixation. So if the fixation were to move here, the response field would be moving with it. Now, when the monkey is looking at the fixation, a cue appears. That cue is this black circle, which means this is going to be the target of your movement. So this is, it's like a letter A that appears. And the letter A means this Q is going to be the one that matters to you. Okay, so now you give a center point fixation to the animal. And now the response field for the neuron moves with the fixation and goes to here. And now this happens to be the Q that the animal received, which means that you should prepare to make a movement upward. Why? Because I gave you a Q that said, the circle is going to be the one that's going to be your target. So when the monkey is looking at this point and the response field of the neuron is, happens to be centered on this eventual movement that the animal has to make to get juice for it, the activity of